Everybody has to put them on the phone. This room gets progressively colder the further into the day you get. I've given up on trying to get temperature control to work here. This is like an extension of what investment banks and businesses do when they have meetings. I've always wondered, what, what's the objective here? Why do you keep the temperature at like 55 degrees? And you know what their answer is, right? It keeps people awake. But they're freezing to death. So what if they're awake and they can't listen to you because they're too busy surviving? So if you're cold, complain to somebody, don't complain to me. I, I've, I, I have given up on trying to get this temperature right. But uh, it is a cold room. Today, I want to start with two things. One is uh, when I put the Tesla valuation of the week last week, I said, let's make this a crowd valuation, right? So there were 89 of you, or maybe 93 of you who did the valuations, and thank you for doing it. So I pulled your valuations up. I decided to do a distribution. And this might be pure coincidence, but the middle of the distribution worked out roughly where I put out as my base case. I mean, I don't know the answer to this, but what if I put out a base case of 180? Do you think this distribution might be affected? It's bias, right? It's not good or bad. It's reality. Stock is actually trading at 200 today. Could that affect your valuation? Absolutely. When you see the price rise, you say, I must be missing something. Let me go in and nudge it. Again, what I'm trying to say is that it's, you know, it's something you've got to take as a given. Deal honestly with it. Rather than say, no, this is objective. I don't do any of that stuff. I don't let the market feedback affect me because it does. So today's session, we're going to talk about risk-free rate. So what I'd like to do is start, start today's session with a test on risk-free rates. So let me set up this, set the stage. You're valuing a Brazilian company. You've decided to value, yeah, and you have a choice. You can either value it in Brazilian reais or you can value it in US dollars. The risk-free rate in reais is 7.5%. The risk-free rate in dollars is 2.5%. Today's class, we'll talk about why risk-free rates vary across currencies, but the risk-free rate in reais is much higher than the risk-free rate in dollars. You have a choice of valuing neither currency, right? Different risk-free rates. In which currency will you derive a higher value for the company? Don't be too quick to jump in because it seems the answer is obvious, but it might not be. Which currency will you get the higher value? Will you get it in US dollars because it has a lower risk-free rate, Brazilian reais because it has a higher risk-free rate, or should it not matter? How many of you think it should be in US dollars? Okay. You've given me an opening to increase the value of a company then, right? All I'm going to do is switch to another currency with a lower risk-free rate. So why stop at US dollars? Why not go to Japanese yen, right? Would you like to get the same value with the, with the two currencies? It's the same company, same point in time. If you tell me it's cheap in dollars and expensive in reais, I'm not even sure what to do with that. You see that if you get 
Today, we're going to talk about why using different currencies should not affect evaluation. Sounds completely irrational, but we're going to crack what I call the currency code. A code that seems to be a mystery to a lot of people doing valuation, but we'll set it to the side. Second question, and this is related to the first one. Whenever you use a currency, you're doing your analysis in what are called nominal terms. What does that mean? You're trying to bring in expected inflation, even though you might not do it explicitly, into your cash flows through growth rates and expected future cash flows and into your discount rate. But you could choose to do your entire valuation, ignoring inflation entirely. And that seems tempting at times when inflation is high and unstable. Say, so you know what? I'm going to I'm going to ignore the problem. I'm going to remove the problem. That's called doing your analysis in real terms. Sounds fancy, but you're essentially forecasting your cash flows as a company without inflation behind you in, at your back and getting a discount rate that's a real discount rate. So I'm going to reframe the question I asked about dollars and reais in terms of nominal versus real valuation. Everything has to be, you can't selectively say, I'll do my prices. And if you go the real route, inflation has to go out of everything, right? So you can choose to do it line item by line item. If you think inflation is going to affect your cost differently from revenue. So you can do the total cash flows in nominal and remove the inflate. But inflation has to leave. If it stays in the game, it's not a real analysis. Would you like, again, if you would you like to get the same value for your company in nominal and real terms? I would. The analysts who, you know, most used real analyses were Latin American analysts until very recently. Almost all Latin American analysis was either done in US dollars or it was done in real terms. They asked analysts, why are you doing it in real terms? Their answer was because we don't like to deal with inflation. But inflation is like having an elephant in your living room. When it moves, you will notice. If you decide to do everything in real terms, it looks like you've avoided the inflation bogeyman, but you're going to see that it's going to come back in your analysis later. One way or the other, you're going to have to deal with inflation. Another aspect of rates, and this is something, especially in the last decade, has made people tear their, their hair out. If you look at the last decade, we've had really low interest rates, right? And if you ask most people the reason they give, if you listen to CNBC, the culprit is the Fed. The Fed has kept rates low. It's one of the most absurd reaches you can think of. Sounds like the Fed must be setting rates. So this is a question we'll try to address today. Have rates stayed low in the last decade because of QE1 and QE2 and the Fed? Or consider an experiment. What if the Fed had not existed in the last decade? Would rates have been low anywhere? Which means you got to think about what keeps rates low. What is it that drives rates? Because it can't be a central banker moving a lever up and down, right? Because if that were the case, you would never have high rates. The, rate, the central banker would adjust the rates to what? We're missing something with this Fed obsession. We're missing a lot of things with the Fed obsession in the last decade, it's taken over common sense. So we're gonna talk about hey, what role do Fed, what's the rate, and maybe you can tell me this, what's the only rate the Fed actually sets? The Fed funds rate. Everything else is set by markets, right? The Fed doesn't set US treasury rates. It doesn't set mortgage rates. So before you freak out and you say that 6% mortgage payment, don't go and do something rash at the Fed. They did not set the mortgage rate. So we're going to talk about the transmission mechanism, if one exists, between a Fed saying we're going to have a higher Fed funds rate. That's what the FOMC can do. And whether rates then go up or down because the Fed has raised a low. Because what's the story for this year? What rates will do this year is going to depend on what the Fed does. It's part of that extension of that Fed obsession. The Fed is going to set rates. So I want to talk about what it is that's driving. This was actually true, I think, a couple of last week 
the Federal Open Market Committee was meeting. And in keeping with the Fed obsession, you know what's happened to markets when the Federal Open Market Committee meets. The entire, all markets come to a standstill. It's like they're waiting for smokes, you know how in the Vatican when they elect a new pope. So the Federal Open Market Committee meets in a closed room, they send smoke signals. Black smoke means rates are going up, white smoke means rates are going down, and everybody else just waits for the smoke to come out. If the Fed truly sets rates, I understand that obsession, but I'd like to dig a little deeper as to why rates were as low as they were. Final point, and this is uh, again something that is relatively recent. In the last probably five, six, seven years, there have been at least three or four currencies which have had negative risk free rates. And it makes us uncomfortable, right? Because when you took your Econ 101 class, did you ever talk about rates being negative? You always talked about pre present consumption over future consumption rate. And for many people, this is the first time in their experience or any people, anybody's experience that rates have been negative. And when something is unusual, people assume that it must be wrong and they've been trying to fix it. European analysts, for instance, have often tried to replace the negative. So when you think about negative rates, one of the things I heard over the last decade is when rates turn negative, you cannot do valuation. I want you to think about that for a moment. What is it about rates turning negative that leads you to this conclusion that, because you know what the extension of that is, let's stop valuing companies, let's price. And there were some people who did this. In fact, many people stopped doing valuation because rates turned negative. There were another group that did something very human. What's the part of the number that's troubling you? The minus in the front, right? It's so easy to fix. Just go plus, there's your problem. You replace and they normalized rates. It made them feel much better. They took the minus 2% and said, you know what? I'll make it plus 2%. My problem's gone away. Are you giving me a landscape for fixing every money losing company, right? What do I do? I take the losses them into profits. What money losing company? So today I want to talk about negative interest rates and I'm going to argue that they're unusual, but they're not some strange phenomenon that should never happen. We'll talk about what it is that causes rates to be negative and then what do you do in valuation when rates turn negative? So lots on our agenda. Let's go back and get to to the, the main lecture note packet. And let's continue our discussion of risk. So if you remember last session, I talked about all the different ways you can bucket risk, right? It can be micro risk or macro risk, estimation risk or economic risk, discrete risk or continuous risk. Today, I want to lay the foundations for thinking about how much of that risk should you show in a discount rate? So I'm going to start with a very basic statement that's going to sound completely counterintuitive. Not all risk matters. So your urge might be, look, I'm exposed to a lot of risk. Let me bring it to the discount rate. But I'm going to argue that you, before you take that leap, step back and say, maybe not all that risk matters. You're saying, why not? Because risk has to be seen, not through your eyes or my eyes, but through the eyes of the people who are pricing the company. I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. The risk you see in an investment is the risk it adds to your portfolio, right? So if you have 10 stocks in your portfolio, add 11 stock, you don't look at the 11 stock by itself. You look at what your portfolio, what, how much risk it adds to the rest of your portfolio. That changes your perspective on risk because it means that the risk you bring into your cost of equity is the risk added to whatever portfolio you have. The marginal investor in your company is the investor who's most likely to be able to set prices. And I'll be quite honest, I've never been the marginal investor in any company for a simple reason. I'm not going to affect prices. I just don't have enough money. Maybe you do, but I don't. Which means if you're talking about marginal investors, you're talking about investors with a lot of money who trade, which effectively means that in most companies, it's going to be some type of institutional investor, right? We can dance around this as much as we want. It could be Vanguard for one company and State Street for another and BlackRock for another. 
And those are investors who own not just one stock, not just 10 stocks, but often 30 or 40 or 50 stocks. People often make modern portfolio theory the enemy of valuation. This has nothing to do with modern portfolio theory, right? Remember they're all saying, don't put all your eggs in one basket. I don't think Harry Markowitz made that saying. That probably goes back 800 years. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. That's an argument for a spread your bets. Have eight or 10 stocks, not just the one stock you like. And the minute you do that, the risk you measure will be the risk added on to a portfolio. Changes the way we think about risk. We'll come back and talk about what, are, what about those special circumstances. We have somebody who's completely undiversified who buys just one investment. If you're a public market investor and you do that, that's your problem. I'm not going to come and bail you out. But you can see why in private businesses this can happen, right? You're a doctor who wants to buy a practice. You're a young doctor. You already have, what, a $400,000 loan from medical school? You're not exactly flush with cash, right? You take whatever wealth you have and you put it all into this medical practice you're buying. You're the exact opposite of diversified. There, the risk you care about is everything that affects that practice. So we're going to talk about what to do when you're not diversified, but we're going to start with the premise that we're looking at publicly traded companies. You don't have to be diversified, but the marginal investors are diversified. You have to think about risk through that. So with that lead said, I'm going to give you a one-page, two-minute summary of risk and return models because I have zero desire to go back and go through this over and over again. You've seen enough classes on it. So I'm, you know, every risk and return model in finance is built on the premise that the only risk you build into cost of equity is risk you cannot diversify away. Let's start with that statement. The only differences across the models is how they measure that risk. That's not the oldest and still most widely used risk and return model in finance. You go into every investment bank, every consulting firm. It's a capital asset pricing model at the CAPM. 1964, 58 years old, 59 years old. It's showing its age. But in the capital asset pricing model, you measure that risk you cannot diversify with one number. The beta. But to get there, we had to make some gigantic assumptions. In the capital asset pricing model, it turns out that the two big assumptions that drive the model is first, there are no transactions costs. So basically buy a share, it costs you nothing. We're close to that already, right? Basically, if you look at Robinhood charges you nothing, Schwab online charges you 595. So that's not that huge an assumption. Second, you have to assume that you have no private information. That's a euphemism for you can't pick stocks. You say, why do you need those two assumptions? The, the argument for diversification is a common sense one, right? Spread your bets. Every additional investment is basically making uh, that firm-specific risk get smaller and smaller. And that diversification benefit exists when you add the first stock, the second stock, the third stock, the 51st stock, the 501st stock, but the benefit gets smaller and smaller as you get to be more and more diversified, right? There's a benefit from going from the 10th stock to the 11th that's much greater than from the 100th to 101st stock. And normally we stop. We stop for one of two reasons. We stop because there's a transactions cost. We say, you know, the benefit has become too small. I'm going to stop at 100 stocks. And the second reason we stop is because nobody wants to be an average investor. You don't get much say in cocktail parties. You go and say, I made the average return, right? We all want to beat the market. We think we found a way to do it. In other words, we live in a world where whether it's true or not, we believe we're bringing something special to the table. You see why, what the CAPM assumptions do? I've removed the two reasons for stopping. If I remove the two reasons for stopping, what's going to be in your portfolio? Every single traded asset in the market. That's all the CAPM you need to know. You've just derived the CAPM because once we all hold that portfolio with every single trade, let's call it, what should we call it? Is every single traded asset in the market? Oh, we call it the market portfolio. How creative is that? We all hold the market portfolio. So the way we measure risk is how much risk will this stock add? That's what a beta measures.
It's a cap M, everything's captured in a beta. And we're capturing all kinds of mark macro risk in there, right? That, that one beta should capture inflation risk and interest rate risk and all the macro risk. So about 14 years later, you had a second model called the arbitrage pricing model that says, why are we trying to load it all up in one number? Why don't we allow for different sources of market risk? We're still in the same, not the same notion of only the risk you can't divide. Let's estimate a beta against each one. The arbitrage pricing model, you could have five betas, but still five factors that affect all stocks. And the factors were unnamed. It was a statistical model. That's why it's called an arbitrage pricing model. So what is factor one? Is it factor one? Not particularly intuitive, right? Because who wants to pay a higher return or expect a higher return because you're exposed to factor one, but you have no idea what it is. And in the following decade, people started to do research, put names on the factors. The first factor is interest rate. The second is the slope of the yield curve. The third is default spreads. When you do that, you've gone from an arbitrage pricing model to a multi-factor model, but you're working within the same template, which is now... You have five factors, but they're named and you have betas against each one. And then about 20 years ago, two researchers at the University of Chicago, Chicago, Gene Farmer and Ken Friend said, why are we even trying to get these models? All we need to figure out is what kinds of companies earn high returns and what kinds of companies earn low returns over long periods. Do you see where they were going, right? They said, our objective is to find out which companies are riskier, risky. And we assume that markets are roughly right the stocks that earn a high return should be riskier than stocks that earn low returns, especially over long periods. You've kind of given up on measuring risk, but then you look for proxies. Your small companies earn higher returns than large companies. Therefore, they must be riskier. All the factor models we've seen in the last 20 years essentially use data to say, hey, the data tells us these companies earn high returns. Therefore, they must be riskier. There, I've tried to compress. 50 years of you know, risk and return theory in corporate finance into one page. But to be quite honest, everything beyond this is going to be self-defeating. There's nothing more in terms of icing you're going to get on the cake that's going to add to the process as long as you recognize what they share in common, a risk free rate. And either one beta or multiple beta is all trying to measure risk you cannot diversify with. Yes, There's no rule here. You're still measuring return. That's a judgment you have to make as an investor, right? If you want to maximize return, you have to tell me how much risk you're willing to take, right? You can't just, you can't have an objective function with no, no, no constraint. So if that's your rule, then what are you going to do? You're going to go find, at least in the CAPM world, you know what you need to do, right? To maximize returns. Because if you think about maximizing returns, let me go buy the riskiest stocks in the market. In the CAPM world, that's not what you'll do because it, you give up too much. So in the CAPM world, how do you maximize returns? What would you do? No, don't plot. Forget about the graph. Tell me in practical terms what you'd do. It doesn't answer my question, right? What is your sweet spot? Yes, we're still talking around. There's only one thing to hold. What, is it, what do we all hold? The market portfolio. There is only one sweet spot. So you have to find a way to be more exposed than she is to get a higher return. And if you're both holding the same thing, what's the only way for you to get a higher return in the cap M world? You got to borrow money. You borrow money, you buy the same index, your expected return will be much higher because you have less equity at play, right? So when stocks go up 10% and you pay 4% as interest, you're going to make 35%. You think, this is great. I'm going to borrow and keep borrowing. There's a downside, which is stocks don't just go up. They sometimes go down. It's a double-edged sword. So in the CAPM world, if you want to maximize returns, I'll give you a pathway. Borrow money, buy on margin, and buy that supremely diversified index fund. So the choice of maximizing returns kind of is up to you. You have to decide how risk-averse you are, how much risk you're willing to take. And then you maximize returns subject to how much risk. That's why you need that second part. Because if you just say, if you walked into my office, I'm a wealth manager, I want to maximize returns. And I don't ask you any other questions. And I take all your money and buy deep out of the money options with it. I maximize your expected return with one potential small downside, which is you could lose it all in the next two weeks. And you come back and say, what the hell did you do? You told me to maximize returns. Never ask 
somebody to maximize returns without putting a subject to, I don't, can't afford to lose more than 50% of this or 20%. The minute you add that constraint, you maximize expected returns given that constraint. You had a question? Do you have your hand up? Is there somebody here? No? Okay. So that's all I'm going to say about risk and return models because we have practical things to do. We have to value companies. We can't be spending the next 10 weeks talking about risk and return models. So let's boil it down to basics. No matter which of these models you look at, there are three ingredients you need to put them into practice. You need a risk free rate. Without a risk free rate, everything else becomes smooth. If you don't know what you can make on a guaranteed investment, you can't even build off that base. So we're going to, there's a risk free rate. You need a price of risk in the equity market. We're going to call it an equity risk premium. If it's a cap M, you need one equity risk premium. If you have the arbitrage pricing model, a multi factor model with five betas, you need five risk premiums. So you need a risk free rate and a risk premium. And so far, your company hasn't even entered the mix, right? Those are external numbers, risk rate and risk premiums. The third input I need is how risky is your company relative to other companies? So that's the only input in this model that's company specific. I often get emails from people saying, I'm evaluating a chemical company. What equity risk premium should I use for a chemical company? Equity risk premiums are market-wide. The beta that you use is what's going to capture the risky company or safe company. Part of the trick in valuation is to keep things in the place they're meant to go. Because you let them slip into other inputs, you're going to be double counting, triple counting, quadruple counting risk. So which of those three inputs do you think should be the easiest to get? Risk free rates, relative risk slash beta, or equity risk. Let's start the, the, the easy. What do you think? Of, which of the three do you think? Should? Risk free rate, right? When I did my MBA, which was a lifetime ago, you know how much time you spend on the risk free rate? I think two minutes. I was told the US Treasury rate is the risk free rate, and we moved on. Shows you how dollar centric my MBA program was and how little time we spent thinking about risk free rates. It's not that easy. So, to understand risk free rates, I'm going to set the table. For something to be risk free, you need to know exactly what you're going to make guaranteed. Everybody agree with that definition? So think of what has to be true for something to be risk-free. First, the entity issuing whatever you've invested in can have no default risk, not even an iota. Because the minute there's default risk, your return is not guaranteed, right? Second, and this might sound mysterious, there can be no reinvestment risk. Let me explain. Let's suppose you're trying to come up with a risk-free rate for a 10-year cash flow. Can I use a three-month table rate for that? I know exactly what I'll make over the next three months, assuming the US Treasury doesn't default. But at the end of three months, I have to find a new table and a new one. And I don't know what the rates will be, which means a three month table is not risk free with a 10 year cash flow. A 10 year T bond is not risk free if you're looking at a one year cash flow. I think you know, if you bought a T bond a year ago, you thought you were buying a guaranteed return. T bonds are down 18%. The return was minus 18%. Why? Because rates change. When rates change, the price of the bond changes. So here's what I draw from this. First, when you ask me what a risk free rate is, your question is incomplete. I have to ask you over what time horizon, right? I want to know whether you want a risk free rate for the next three months. I'm going to give you a very different answer than if you're a risk free rate for the next 10 years. Second, you've got to tell me what currency you're asking in. Maybe you are thinking in Turkish lira. I can't be giving you a risk-free rate in US dollars if you want to. So risk-free rates have to have a currency component. And third, remember that no default risk that you need? I was taught that government bonds are risk-free in the local currency. And there's a very simple logic for that, right? Why should a government issuing a bond in the local currency What's the rationale for why they should never default? What should they be able to do? Print more money, right? So historically in classrooms around the world and in investment banks and offices around the world, if you ask what's the risk-free rate in rupees, we take the Indian government bond rate. Implicit there is governments don't default in the local currency. The only problem is it runs head first 
into a reality, which is not only do governments default in local currencies, they do it an awful lot of the time. Half of all sovereign defaults in the last 50 years have come from governments defaulting on the local currency. It sounds absurd. Why would they just not print the money? So help me out here. Why? Think like a government, right? There's a big debt payment coming due. You can always print the money and make the payment. Why might you choose to default rather than printing the money? What happens if you print the money? Yeah. It's not good. I double the amount of currency. I debase my currency. Devalue is just too kind of word. I debase my currency. And I'm going to make a statement and I'll try to back it up easy. Latin America has been the epicenter of both default and inflation for the last, what, 200 years? It's almost like they perfected it to an art form. And I've been, I used to go to Brazil almost every year between 1997 until COVID hit. And my first visit was in 1997. This was five years after Brazil had gone through hyperinflation, 5,500%, 6,000%. I did a two-day valuation seminar. And every question I was asked over the two days was about inflation. Nobody wanted to talk about companies, business models. People had been so burnt by inflation that not only they worry about inflation, but no Brazilian entity was able to issue long-term bonds denominated in reais. Do you see why? After you've had 5,500% inflation, if I try to say, I'm issuing a 10-year bond, you say, right, I'm, buy I'm not buying that bond. The Brazilian government could not issue 10 year bonds in reais. It took until 2006, 14 years after hyperinflation, before the Brazilian government is able to issue bonds in reais. It took a long time to come back from debasement. In contrast, think about Argentina. Now, I was in Uruguay like 10 years ago doing a seminar, and somebody in the audience said, What do we do about Argentina? And for those of you not familiar with Uruguay, it's this tiny country with 3 million people right next door to Argentina. And I said, think of Argentina as this alcoholic crazed uncle who lives in the attic of your house, who comes down every two or three hours, says something weird, and then goes back up. It's, you can't, no, he lives in your house. You can't ignore it. But my point is, in any just world, nobody should ever lend to Argentina ever again, right? Just in the last 20 years, how many times has Argentina defaulted? But you see the amazing thing. Two years after default, they're back again. I remember in 2016, another big seminar in Buenos Aires. Argentina's back again. Portfolio managed from around the world. It's almost like they had collective amnesia about the last time they did this. Countries have learned that it's easier to come back from default than from debasement. So you know what? Just because you have a government bond rate doesn't mean you've got a risk-free rate, which means your job got a little more difficult, right? In some currencies, you have some cleaning up to do to get to risk-free rate. So here's how I'm going to approach the risk-free rate discussion. I'm going to hit you with a series of questions. And along the way, we're going to pretty much deal with every conceivable challenge with risk-free rates that you can think of. So let's say you're valuing a company in US dollars. You want a US dollar risk-free rate. And let's, for the moment, look at US treasuries. I'm going to give you a series of rates. And I want you to tell me which one you will use as a risk-free rate for evaluation. So I'm going to be very explicit because in evaluation, you're estimating cash flows next year, two years out, three years out, four years. In fact, you're estimating cash flows forever, right? So I want you to keep that in the back of your, of your mind and tell me which of these rates you would use as a risk rate. A three-month table rate? You know, a third of all DCFs I see use the three-month three table rate. Tell me what's wrong with that. What, what am I doing wrong? Yeah. It's a duration mismatch, right? First rule, if you have cash flows that go 30, 40, 50 years, don't use something that's a three-month rate. I've never understood people who hold on to three-month rates as risk rate rates. But there are Textbooks actually say, use the table rate. It's the safest of the treasury rates. Not true. So let's go long term. You have the 10-year T-bond. You got the 30-year T-bond. If you just were a purist picking risk free rates, which of those is a better, better choice for valuation? You want to try? 
you're doing the valuation. So you tell me how long your cash flows lasted. What happens after the end of 10 years when you're valuing a company? And what does the terminal value capture? Cash flows forever. Right? Don't let the period that you estimate the cash flows drive your risk free rate. This has nothing to do with it, right? So just because you stop in five years doesn't mean you stopped estimating cash flows. You just assume that beyond year five, cash flows will continue to grow at 3% a year forever. There are no perpetual US treasuries. The British and the Canadian governments used to have perpetual bonds called console bonds. There are no US consoles. So if I had to pick a pure risk-free rate, I would probably go with the 30-year rate, longer term. But you're going to see me use the 10-year rate as my risk-free rate in US dollars. For the rest. And I'll tell you why. It's a pragmatic choice. The risk-free rate is just the start of my estimation problem, right? I have to estimate risk premiums, for instance, for, the, for cost of debt. I have to come up with default spreads. You know how I come up with default spreads? I find corporate bonds with the same maturity and compare them to the US T bond. You see why I don't want to go with the 30-year T-bond? Because if I find, make that my base, I have to find 30-year corporates. It's really difficult to find 30-year corporates. So I'm going to go with the 10-year T-bond, even though I know I'm probably undershooting, partly because it makes the rest of my estimation easier, and partly because the 10-year T-bond is, you know, it's a one bond you see report in the Wall Street Journal in the top. The reason it gets reported is every Monday, it's in every auction. 30-year bonds are infrequent. They're much in a much smaller quantity. So I'm going to go with the 10-year bond with no apologies. It's, it's, you know, it's a 10-year rate. I know it stops up to year 10. And in most other currencies, you don't even have the choice. 10 years is about as good as you can get. Question, I'm sorry. Disney had a century bond, but none of those are risk-free. Right? Petrobras definitely is not risk-free. And even Disney is not risk-free. Companies have issued 100-year bonds, and governments have. The Brazilian and Canadian governments used to have console bonds. The U.S. Treasury has never gone beyond 30 years, right? There's no reason why they cannot. In fact, you could argue that maybe when rates were low, they should have just gone and locked it in forever. Right? That moment has passed. You could, you could, that's a good question. I said your one year risk-free rate can be different from your two year, year risk-free rate. So you could actually technically estimate a, use the one year treasury for the one year risk-free, the two year treasury for the two year risk-free. The only question is how much difference will it make? And here's why I'm not gonna bother. What's your biggest cash flow in your valuation? It's not gonna be a year one, it's not gonna be year two, it's gonna be a terminal value, right? So if it made a significant enough difference in valuation, that's worth considering. And I'll tell you when it makes a significant difference, when you've got a steep yield curve in either direction. You might say, you know what? I don't want to use the 10-year rate. It's way below my one-year rate. I'm going to use the one-year rate for my one-year cash flow. So if it's going to make a difference, and you can tell mathematically if it is, then it's completely okay. In fact, it's probably the purest way of doing risk-free rates is take each cash flow and have a risk-free rate that matches that cash flow. And if you go to check a Bloomberg terminal, you can get a yield curve of zero coupons. It goes from one year to 30 years. So getting the information is easy. It'll make your present value a little tedious. You can't use the PV function in Excel, but that, you know, that horse you know, bolted, whatever. You, you know what I'm talking about. So once you started to think about discount rates varying across time, you couldn't use a PV function. So that's perfectly okay. You can have a risk-free rate that varies for each cash flow. Now, what about a tips rate? Why can't I use it as my risk free rate if I'm using doing a US? You've heard of what tips rate is? A tips rate is an inflation protected treasury bond. It's about at one and a half percent right now. And here's how it works. You buy a tips bond, you get one and a half percent plus whatever the inflation rate is that year. So if next year inflation is 2%, you get 1.5 plus 2%, you get 3.5%. If inflation is 8%, you get 1.5 plus 8%, 9.5%. So what does that make the 1.5%? Remember I talked about real valuations and real valuations. If I were doing a valuation of a company in real terms, the 1.5% would be my risk-free rate. 
But the minute I decide to go down the dollar route, I've chosen a nominal cash flow. The tips rate is no longer the right risk free rate because I'm doing my analysis in nominal terms. So we'll come back to the tips rate in the context of real valuation, but doesn't fit. What about ENF? I've seen people do this. I'll pick the highest of the numbers. Why? I want to be conservative. What's wrong with you? This is a risk-free rate. You want to pick a number because it's high. Why don't you just make up a number, 100% risk-free rate? That would be really conservative. It's as dumb as it gets. And I, no, I'm not holding back on it. So don't use the highest of the numbers or the lowest of the numbers. It makes You've lost entirely all the consistency in what a risk-free rate is. Now, in doing all of this, though, I'm making an implicit assumption that could come back to bite me, right? Which is about the U.S. Treasury. What am I assuming implicitly about the U.S. Treasury when I'm using any of these rates as a risk rate? Eh? That will not default, right? Ten year, maybe 15 years ago, there was no question about that. But in 2012, there was actually an incident during the summer of 2012 where S&P lowered the rating for the U.S. Historically, the U.S. has always been AAA, from AAA to AA. Now, people, you know, Moody's did not lower it. There was a lot of debate. But the Pandora's box has been opened, right? It is now open for debate. We're coming up to another debt ceiling. And there's talk of what if, you know, Congress doesn't get through it. I think it's legitimate to ask the question, is the U.S. Treasury default free? For the moment, I'm leaving it as default free, but I'm going to leave that door open just in case I change my mind. Let's move on to a different currency. So right now, I'm going to use the 10-year T-bond rate. What is it at? I think it's like 3.51, 3.53, something like that. So that's going to be my risk free rate for the moment. It could very quickly change in two weeks or four weeks, but that's going to be my risk free rate. Anybody valuing a European company in Italian, Spanish? Uh, anybody? Who are you value? Siemens, the German company. And who are you valuing? Where is it? Uh, UK. The UK, we've got to keep separate because I want to keep it to the Eurozone for the moment. The UK, we have a different issue of what, you know, what the risk free rate is. So you have Siemens. You're going to do your valuation in Euros? Okay. So you want a Euro risk free rate, right? So I could give you a government bond rate in euros. In fact, I could give you a dozen European governments, all of which have 10-year bond rates. Here's where they are. Which of these rates would you use as a risk-free rate and why? They're different, right? You've got to pick which one would you use and why. No, not the answer. Because then you're saying if you did a Spanish company, you'd be using the Spanish government bond rate, right? And God help you, if you're doing a Greek company, you'd be using a Greek government bond rate. Can you imagine saying Greek government bond rate risk-free? I mean, I, do those words even kind of go together? I mean, step back. Why are these rates? They're all in euros, right? This is not 1997. We had drachmas and lira and, 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 and deutschmarks. These are all euro bonds. They're all 10-year bonds. What's the reason for differences across the rates? Forget about the rating, right? The, why do markets, why, why do why didn't markets, uh, the Greek rates higher than, uh, for, if, even if a rating state did not exist, you'd still have these differences in rates. No, forget, you're, you're giving me the symptom, not the cause, right? Why are you paying less for the Greek 10-year government bond in euros than the German 10-year bond in euros? Let's make it more specific. As a bond holder, what's the only component of risk you care about? Default. Right? The rates are different because there's more default risk in some of the EU countries than there is in others, which already then means if you're talking about something risk free, a Greek government bond can never enter the conversation. A Spanish, in fact, any bond here other than the German euro bond, you've already lost the script, right? Because you're using a rate that has some default risk in it and you're calling it risk free. So you know what? You're going to use the German euro bond for your company, not just because it's a German company, but because it is the risk-free rate in yours. In fact, 10 years from now, the Portuguese 10-year euro bond, miracles can happen, was the lowest number here 
you know what you should use, right? You should use the Portuguese. This has nothing to do with this being Germany. For the moment, it's Germany, but it could be whatever country has the lowest rate. And even they are saying, please, God, let there not be enough default. In fact, there are some people who argue you should use the ECB, the European Central Bank bond. It's almost exactly the German euro bond rate. But you're looking for something default free. And here you found a country which is AAA rated and you're latching on to that rate. So for those of you doing any company in euros, your risk-free rate is going to be the German euro bond rate, even if it's an Italian company. I know you want to punish this company for being Greek. I'll give you plenty of chances to do that. Just don't do it in the risk-free rate, right? Go ahead. Yeah, th now, that's going to be my next one. So let's suppose you're looking at India, right? There's no AAA entity issuing Indian rupee bonds. The Indian government has a 10-year bond that's trading at about 7.34% on January 1st, 2023. Most Indian analysts use the 7.34% as a risk-free rate in rupees. There's one stop they forgot to make before they got to their destination, right? Which is, is any of this due to perceived default risk in India. So I cheated. To answer that question, I went to Moody's. I know ratings agencies are not the sharpest knives in the drawer. They come to their conclusions too late, but it's free and it's accessible and they have sovereign ratings for every country. They have a local currency rating and a foreign currency rating for every country. What's a foreign currency rating? When India borrows money in yen or euros or dollars, a foreign currency rating is supposed to apply. The local currency rating is the risk that Moody sees in India when it raises money in rupees, like on this government bond. You know what I was hoping and praying I would see? What would make my life easy? A AAA local currency rating, in which case I'd have used the 7.34% as my risk free rate and blame Moody's if something went wrong. They gave me a BAA3 rating. Just to give you some perspective, India's rating has changed fairly dramatically towards a positive side over the last 20 years. They moved in the right direction, but BAA3 still means there's default risk, which means that 7.34% has some default risk in it, and I'd like to take it out, right? If I could tell you how much of that 7.34% is due to default risk, simple algebra. You take it out, you'll have a risk-free rate. I'll take you through the process of estimating that default spread. But in this case, in early 2023, the default spread I estimated for a BAA3 rated sovereign was 2.69%. So I'm going to set up an algebra problem for you. The Indian government bond rate in rupees is 7.43%. Sorry, 7.34%. You're trying to value a company in Indian rupees. You can take the conventional route of saying it's a government bond. I'm done. 7.34% is your risk free rate. I'm going to argue that you're setting yourself up to double count country risk if you do that. And you're going to see what I mean by that. The second is you can take the 7.34% and add 2.69%. Is that the right way to go? Am I going the right direction, the wrong direction? I'm actually double counting default spread, right? So the right thing to do is take the 2.69% out, which means my risk-free rate in rupees is 4.65%. You know how many people who saw my Adan evaluation last week wrote me back, you got the risk-free rate wrong? It's 7.4%. I said, no, no, that's, you know, your definition of risk-free rate and mine are varying because that 7.4% is a government bond rate. That's not what I use as my risk-free rate. And I'm going to talk about where the double counting comes in if you don't do this. But if you have a currency where there is no default free entity, you need to clean up the government bond rate, which means this number gets critical, right? The 2.69%. How do I get that? So I'll give you three pathways you can use. The first is if your country, the country you're looking at, has issued bonds in a currency where there's something risk free. I'll give you, and I'll make this specific. Most of the Latin American countries, issue 10-year bonds, not only in the local currency, but also in US dollars. Brazil issues 10-year dollar bonds. Peru issues 10-year dollar bonds. So you can look up the rate on that bond. So for if you look at Brazil, you'll see the 10-year bond is 5.83% or 6.5%. You compare it to the USD bond, that difference is a bond market judgment and what the default spread is. 
Until 30 years ago, that was the only place you could go to get the false spreads. The only problem with that approach is it works for about 20 countries because most countries, India, for instance, does not issue 10 year bonds in another currency. It works really well in Latin America. It works relatively well in Eastern Europe, like Bulgaria issues Euro denominated bonds. So you can get the default spread. But about 20 years ago, there was a market called the sovereign CDS market that was started. You know what a sovereign CDS spread is the market allows you to do? It allows you to buy insurance against government default. So if you bought a Brazilian bond in dollars and you said, I'm worried about default, you can go to the CDS market and buy protection. And the way you buy protection is, let's say the, the Brazilian government bond is a rate of 7% in dollar terms. That's much better than the 3.5%, right? But there's default risk. You can go to the sovereign CDS market and you can buy insurance and the insurance is quoted on a yearly basis. Right now, that spread is about 3.5%, the Brazil's sovereign CDS. So what does it allow you to do? You buy the Brazilian bond, you collect the 7%. But the insurance guy shows up and says, I want my three and a half percent. So it becomes a market set estimate of the default spread. It's available for about 80 countries now. And, it, and the number keeps growing, but it's a market based number. So if your country has a bond in another currency, like the dollar or the euro, where you can get the risk free rate, you, know, you, have, you have a way. If your country has a sovereign CDS spread, that covers about 80 countries now. Say, so what if my country has neither? And there are about 80 countries which have neither a sovereign CDS spread, nor do they have a bond in a different currency. But many of them have ratings from Moody's. They have BAA, BA, B, C, triple C, whatever. So starting about 20 years ago, I started creating a lookup table based on rated countries which had sovereign CDS spreads. But if you tell me what the spread is, I can estimate what your rating is. I'll tell you what the spread is. So I'm going to take Brazil through all three approaches so you can see how this would play out in practical terms. So let's say start of 2023, you're trying to estimate a default spread for Brazil. Why? Because you want to get a risk-free rate in REIs. Here's the first. These are dollar denominated bonds. There's a Brazilian 10 year dollar denominated bond, 6.15%. You cannot compare bond rates in different currencies. That's apples and oranges, but I can compare a dollar denominated bond issued by Brazil to a dollar denominated bond issued by the US. The difference is my estimate of the default spread from the bond market. It's 2.27%. File that away. That's my first shot at getting the default spread. Do I trust it? Bonds, uh, you know, it depends on the trading of the bond, how rich, you know, who's buying the bond. So I went to the sovereign CDS market and Brazil has a sovereign CDS spread that's traded. And according to the sovereign CDS market, that spread is 3.52%, much higher than what you're seeing in the bond market. The sovereign CDS market has an upside because it's a market that it's in real time it can reflect what's happening in real time. The minute Russia invaded Ukraine, the sovereign CDS spreads for Russia and Ukraine shot up. The ratings agencies might not change it for six months or nine months or 10, 12 months. The bonds often stop trading, but the sovereign CDS market keeps churning out numbers. I mean, it has all the downsides of markets. People overreact, they bunch regions together because they don't know what's in Latin America. So if something happens in Brazil, they knock down Peru because you're somewhere in there and you must be in trouble too. So the markets do weird stuff, 3.52%. So that becomes your second estimate of the default spread, but there's one small glitch in the sovereign CDS market which makes it difficult to read that number as a measure of pure default risk. And here's what it is. The sovereign CDS spreads for 80 countries, including countries like Switzerland. You know what? There's not a single country which has a zero sovereign CDS spread, which makes no sense, right? I mean, are you telling me there's no country in the... Are, are any of you lying away? Oh my God, I wonder whether the Swiss government is going to pay its bonds on time. What's going on? This is a market that's still in formation. One of the problems it has had historically is that it had counterparty risk. You know what counterparty risk is? When you buy insurance, it's great, you have insurance, but your insurance is only as good as the insurer you bought the insurance from. If the insurer goes under, there goes your insurance. 
When Lehman went under in 2008, they were one of the biggest players in the sovereign CDS market. They almost took the entire market down with them. Because what's the point of insurance if the other guy never comes through? So I'm going to do this very ad hoc adjustment. I'm going to say, look, the 3.52% you're seeing for Brazil is not entirely for default risk. There are these frictions in this market that makes it a less than pure insurance market. And the way I'm going to measure that friction is going to be very parochial. I'm going to use the US sovereign CDS spread, which is, I think, 27 or 20, 32 basis points at the start of 2023. I could have used this lowest of the spread, Switzerland, for instance, but since I've used the US sovereign CDS spread for as long as I've been doing this, I take it out of the Brazilian spread saying, you know, that's probably more the friction effect. You, if you find that too uncomfortable, just stay with the 3.52%. So the 3.2% becomes my cleaned up proxy of subtracting out the US sovereign CDS spread from the Brazilian spread. So I have two numbers now, a 2.27% spread coming from the government bond market and a 3.2 to 3.5 percent spread coming from the sovereign cds market let me take a third shot and in brazil i can try all three brazil has a rating of ba2 brazil unlike india has gone in the wrong direction it actually started with a higher rating 10 years ago. And in the last 10 years, the rating has kind of slid because of, you know, first the Petrobras, the car wash, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, scandals. And then you had, you know, there's been a series of things that have kind of handicapped it. BA2 rating. Remember what I said about lookup tables? This is a table, as I said, I updated at the start of every year. This is my 2023 update. A BA2 rated bo sovereign bond roughly speaking as a default spread of 3.68%. I get that by averaging out countries with that spread, with that rating and looking at sovereign CDS spreads or bond spreads, 3.68%. This is troublesome, right? 2.27%, 3.2%, 3 3.68%. You're saying, which one should I use? I'm going to say something incredibly odd, but hang in there with me. Pick one, stick with it. Because when you pick it, you're going to say, but I'm getting different answers. In fact, in the risk-free rate, the 10-year government bond rate in Brazil at the start of 2023 was 12.76%. If I net out the spread from the government bond market, my risk-free rate is 10.49% because I'm subtracting out a smaller number. If I net out the spread from the rating, the risk-free rate is 9.08%. And if you just stop there, you're saying, but I'm getting a much higher risk-free rate using the first approach and the third approach. So that must be bad, right? But this is only the first place you're going to run into this because later in this process, I'm going to ask you to estimate a risk premium for Brazil. And guess what? We build our equity risk premiums off. We build it off default spreads. So if you pick a really low default spread at this stage, it'll give you a higher risk-free rate, but it'll also give you a lower risk premium. The one thing you cannot do is go back and forth. Now, do you see what I meant about double counting? If you leave the government bond rate, if I said my risk-free rate in RIAs is 12.76%, and I start adjusting the risk premium for the fact that Brazil is riskier, I am counting Brazil risk twice, once in what I call my risk-free rate and once in what my risk premium is. So once you've picked your company, if it's in a country where there is no default free entity. You're lucky if you're in the dollars or euros or Swiss. Or, but even with, you know, the, the UK is no longer has a AAA rating. The British government guilt rate, the 10 year guilt rate, is not the risk free rate in British pounds. As a colonial power, you're probably saying this is so demeaning. But guess what? Things catch up with you. So to adjust your risk free rate in pounds, you got to take out the default spread in the UK. It's not big. Same thing with Japan. Japan doesn't, hasn't had a AAA rating in about 20 years now. So if you are in a country where there is this issue, try all three approaches if, and see if it works. For some of you, all three will work. Some two out of three. Some you're stuck with just one. And you're saying, what if I'm valuing a Syrian company? God help you. But you know, we'll come back and talk about what to do about Syrian companies. But maybe getting a risk-free rate might not be the biggest of your problems. Yeah. Any questions on the cleaning up? So we'll come back and you know we'll revisit these spreads. Now let me go back 
to doing things in real terms. I said, one of the things you can do if you're really scared about inflation, you don't want to deal with it, is do everything in real terms, which means your cash flows have to be real and your risk-free rate has to be a real risk-free rate. Remember, once you do things in real terms, currency disappears from the process. There is no such thing as real dollars and real yen and real Swiss francs because real is real. They've taken inflation out. You might as well stop talking about currencies. This is where the tips rate can help you. But the problem is you're never doing real valuations in the US. Why? Because it's so much more convenient to do things in nominal terms. The rest of the world operates in a nominal basis, right? Your taxes are based on nominal income. You know where you're going to be doing real analyses? You're in Ghana, you're in Zimbabwe. You're saying, look, you know, I can't deal with the inflation here. I'm going... You're saying, but I can't find something like the tips rate in Zimbabwe. Trust me, don't even look. You will not find it. I'm going to give you an easy way to get a risk-free rate no matter where you are in the world, but then I'm going to add a caveat to it. You know what your risk-free rate should be if you're doing an analysis in real terms in Ghana? 1.5%, the tip, tips rate. What about in Indonesia? 1.5%. And I'll tell you the rationale for doing it. If you're talking about real risk-free rates in a world where capital can move freely across borders, there can be only one real risk-free rate, right? Because if I have a real risk-free rate of 4% in one part of the world, remember, this is truly risk-free and truly real, and 1.5% in another part of the world, what should happen? Money should leave the 1.5% and go to the... But the key, th the key point I made was if capital can flow freely. So when you use the tips rate as a risk-free rate in Ghana, you are ignoring the reality that capital doesn't flow freely, that the real risk-free rate in Ghana could be higher, you know, but I can't think of an easy way to get a real risk-free rate in a, in a currency. My suggestion, if you're really stuck and you're valuing a company in Ghana, do it in South African Rand. Currency is a choice. You can value any company in any currency. When it truly, I mean, I would never value a Russian company in rubles. Yeah. This, to, uh, getting a risk-free rate would take me the next year, right? So I'm going to tell you, if you gave me Gazprom to value, I'll do it in dollar terms. In fact, it's easier to value Gazprom in dollar terms because it's an oil and gas company. It's a, it, it, it sells into a global market that pays it in dollars or the equivalent of dollars. So don't tr if you're having a really tough time even getting the risk-free rate nailed down, that's a signal to you that maybe you need to switch currencies. So now let me give you the big picture. So you, you saw what I did with the Brazilian RIAI and the Indian rupee to get a risk rate in the two currencies, right? At the start of every year and midway through each year, I try to get risk free rates in every currency where there is a 10 year government bond available. Let me, so notice the add on there. Not every government has 10 year bonds outstanding. So there are about 45 currencies where you can get a 10 year bond, a government bond. Then I did what I did with the rupee and the real. I cleaned up that bond. So what you see here in the height of the column is the total government bond rate. The red portion is the default spread. I'm taking it out. And what's left, the blue, is my risk-free rate. So my risk-free rate in Zimbabwe and Kwacha, and I'll confess, I've never valued a company in this currency, is about 16%. My risk-free rate in Turkish lira, it's Turkish lira, it's be somewhere here, I'll find it one of these days. No. But as you can go down, you got Colombian peso, Brazilian ria, Russian ruble, Kenyan shilling. So let me start with an obvious statement. You look at that graph. Risk-free rates vary across currencies. Some currencies have high risk-free rates, some currencies have low risk-free rates, and some can have negative risk-free rates. So here's the question that's going to crack the currency code. I know I've been promising this all the way through this class. Why do risk-free rates vary across currencies? I didn't ask you why government bond rates vary, because then you can do a song and dance about risky countries and safe countries. Assuming I've cleaned up for default risk, why do risk-free rates vary across currencies? Yes. It's got everything to do with inflation. High inflation currencies will have high risk free rates. Low inflation currencies will have low risk free rates. And deflationary currencies could potentially have negative risk free rates, right? And therein lies the answer to why currency doesn't matter in valuation. 
if you pick a high current, high inflation current, you're going to end up at a high discount rate. That's the bad news. What's the good news? When you value a company in that currency, inflation is going to be like a wind at your back. You value a zombie and company. Don't be surprised to see 20% growth, even though it's a mature, slow-growing company, because with 15% inflation, you're going to get this high growth number. Your cash flows will have high growth. Your discount rate will be high, 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 cancel out. If you take that same company and decide to value euros, it's true your discount rate will come down, but when you estimate the growth rate for that company, you can't use a 20% growth rate anymore because 15% of that came from inflation, you might use a 7% growth rate. The key with currencies is to be consistent. If you pick a low inflation currency for your discount rate, you have no choice but to estimate your cash flows in the same currency with the same inflation embedded, because if you don't do that, you've got an inflation mismatch. So when you look at those risk-free rates, remember, Underlying it is a story about inflation, and you've got to be thinking about that inflation when you think about doing evaluation. Now, one of the mythologies about intrinsic valuation is if you do it, it's timeless, but you can just sit on it for the rest of eternity. Who makes up this stuff? I mean, let's say you valued a company a year ago. And let's assume nothing's changed in the company. It's got the same earnings, the same cash flows, the same growth rate. You value the company today. Will your intrinsic value be different today than a year ago? What's changed? The world around you has changed, right? Risk-free rates have shot up. Risk premiums have shot up. You can't value a company in the world you wished you were in. and You got to value the company you're in. So the risk of stating the obvious, you're valuing your company today, you're going to come up with the value. Your, pro, your buy or sell recommendation doesn't happen to when? May 8th, right? You think, what can happen between now and May? Don't tempt fate. That's what people in my class in 2020 ask. What can happen in three months? You know, that's what happened in three months. COVID hit. Treasury rates collapsed. You went from 1.7% T-bond rates to 0.7%. Your T-bill rates went to zero. It is what it is. Complaining about it doesn't make it go away. It is a fact of life. Rates can change and rates change. Your value changes. And my advice to you is to have a separate input page where you keep things like T-bond rates. You know what I mean by separate input page rather than enter and hard code a number into an Excel spreadsheet of 3.47%. Have a separate input page where your spreadsheet copies from it. In fact, if you want to be really clever, you can tie that input page to Yahoo Finance and it can up, it, it's actually a neat looking device, if nothing else, you know. Yeah. Because your rates can then update every moment of every day. It more, might not change most of the time, but Periods like this one, you can see how values can start to very quickly. And it's not just your value that's changing, right? The price is changing as well. You've got two numbers that are shifting. And the question you're asking is, is this company going from being overvalued to undervalued or vice versa? I told you there were 45 currencies on which I was able to find a government bond, which means there are about 100 plus currencies where you don't even have a starting point. See, what do we do then? Seven years ago, I was valuing an Egyptian bank. I don't know why. I just wanted to, you know, must have come up with something that I was asked that I was trying to do. And I wanted to value the bank in Egyptian pounds. So I went an Egyptian pound risk free rate. So I went looking for a 10 year Egyptian government bond denominated Egyptian pounds. There are none. That's one of the 100 currencies where there's no 10 year bond. So here's how I got a risk-free rate in Egyptian pounds. And this is a clever little trick you can use on any currency to get a risk-free rate. What do we say causes risk-free rates to be different across currencies? Differences in inflation, right? So here's what I did. I started with the T-bond rate. It's a dollar risk-free rate of 2%. The inflation rate then in the US dollar was 1.5%. The inflation rate in Egypt was about 15%. See where I'm going to go next, right? Take the difference. If you're in a hurry, just take the 13.5% difference, add it to the T-bond rate. You've got a risk-free rate in Egyptian pounds. In fact, the reason I do it a little messier is because things compound. Inflation is on top of a real rate. It gives you a slightly higher number, but you can see that you can, you'd have 
come pretty close just by adding the differential inflation to a government. So if you have a T-bond rate, you can get differential inflation. You're saying, where the heck am I going to get the inflation in Egypt? The US is easy, right? You just take the T-bond rate, the TIPS rate, you take the difference, you got an expected inflation number. It's about 2.7% now. Egypt, you can go to the the, monitor, the IMF or World Bank, and I think the IMF must makes a five-year forecast. It's completely screwed up most of the time, but you can get a number and blame the IMF if things go wrong. But again, I'm going to say something that's going to sound incredibly odd. If you're going to screw up on the inflation rate, if you screw up consistently, it's not going to matter. Do you know what I mean by that? Let's say 15% is too low an inflation rate for Egypt. What's the mistake I've made? I've come up too low a risk, you know, uh, too low a risk-free rate in Egyptian pounds, too low a discount rate, right? But then when I estimate the cash flows, I use 15%. That's too low an inflation rate. It's great to have mistakes that average out. And on macro variables, this is what I'm looking for. Bail me out here. So what I'm trying to say is, if you're spending a week estimating inflation in some country, don't do it for this class. Do it for some other class because in this class, it's not worth the payoff. Make your best estimate, use the IMF number, move on. But at least now you have a way of estimating risk-free rates in a currency where there is no government bond. Let's continue and complete the risk-free rate discussion. A year ago, when I was teaching this class, the T-bond rate started the year at 1.5%. That was a low number. How low? Depends on how old you were as a person. I tell people, look, people talk about normal as if it's a number we all agree. And one of the tests I would run when I, when I did these sessions the last decade is I'd go in and people say, that's a low rate. It's much lower than a normal rate. And I said, what's a normal rate? Someone says 6%. I said, you've been in the market way too long. If you started in markets in 1980s, what you think of as normal is framed by what your first few years brought you. If you start in the 1990s, 4.5% looks like a normal rate. If you started in the, this century, 2001, 2002, maybe 3, 3.5%. If you start in the last 10 years, you're saying, what's up normal about it? That's what rates always are, 1.5%. Why do you think people are so shocked with 3.5% rates? It's because both, most of them started in markets in 2012 and 2013. They say, oh my God, this is unprecedented. Mortgage rates at 6%. Who's ever seen something like this? When I took my first mortgage in the 80s, it was 12%. What I'm trying to say is this notion that somehow normal is a fact is nonsensical because normal based on what history you look at. But in this case, the tendency people have is to take a current rate because it looks too low and replace it with a normalized rate. How about taking an average over 30 years by looking at what they saw as rates you know, 30 years ago? Do you think that's a good idea to normalize risk-free rates? Let's say I'd done this a year ago. I replaced a one and a half percent with let's say four, maybe 5% as my risk-free rate. Tell me mechanically what's going to happen. My risk-free rate is higher. My discount rate is higher. My value is lower. I'm probably going to find the stock to be overvalued. And when you find a stock to be overvalued, there's actually practical advice you give, right? Go invest in the risk-free investment and wait. And in this case, when I've normalized the risk-free rate, what I'm asking you to do, I'm saying, don't buy the stock. Go buy the T-bond that delivers 5%. One year ago, where the heck are you going to find a T-bond that delivers 5%? This is not something you mess with. Risk-free rates. You can, if you want to normalize margins, normalize growth, go ahead and do it. But don't normalize risk-free rates. This is an actual opportunity cost you face right now. So I don't care whether you think rates are too low or rates are too high or what you think the Fed will do. In valuation, the safest place to be when you think about risk-free rates, whatever the current rate is. You're not saying the market is right. You're saying, but that's what I will have to make if I don't buy this stock. Now let's answer the question, why were rates so low in the last decade? I know the, the Fed is the, 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 the entity that supposedly has kept rates low, but I'll tell you a story about how this can worm into your head and you know, ruin your thinking. About almost a decade ago, I remember going with my wife and my, at that time, my son and 
daughter was at home. They had no choice but to go along and I dragged them. You know, that's why they left for college soon after, I guess. And we went on a tour of the Federal Reserve. Have you guys ever done this? I don't know whether they stopped with COVID, but you can actually go to the Fed building downtown. It's in Marine Street or somewhere in that downtown area. And they take you on a tour. But the most exciting part is when they take you down to the mint and you can see all this cash, don't get any ideas. It's well protected. No. Unless you're part of Ocean 17 or 18 and this is the big heist you're going to pull off. Right? I almost made myself persona non grata right at the start of the tour. So this tour guide comes up. You know, she's obviously very enthusiastic about the Fed. And I almost wanted to ask her the question. The question I was going to ask her is, can you take me to the interest rate room? There must be a room in the Fed where Jerome Powell sits with all these levers. You know what? The T-bond rate is getting a little low. Let me move it up a little. That's the vision you get listening to CNBC, right? That the Fed must be setting all these rates, which is nonsensical because the only rate it sets is the Fed funds rate. The next question I was going to ask her was, can you take me to that window? I'd like to borrow at the Fed funds rate. You can try, but it's not going to work. It's an overnight borrowing rate for banks. It's not for you and I. The Fed doesn't set rates. It sets a Fed funds rate. So where does this illusion about the Fed setting rate it's because you you know i don't know whether I, have i ever told you the story of chanticleer i'll tell you the story it's actually a fun story it's about a rooster who actually is viewed as the most important creature in a farmyard why because the rest of the farmyard animals think that the sun comes up <laughs> because the rooster crows it's an amazing without the rooster there will be no sun until the rooster makes a fatal mistake, forgets to set the alarm on her, on her or his, it has to be a his, his iPhone, doesn't wake up, and guess what the sun does anyway? It comes up, and the rest of the barnyard says, you had nothing to do with this. This is purely coincidence. You managed to crow at exactly the same time, and we thought your crowing made the sun come up. You say, what's this got to do with the Fed? What do we say causes rates to be different? Inflation, right? The Fed is, if you think about interest rates in general, it's an equation called the Fisher equation. It's one of the first things you're taught in Econ 101. Fisher equation says if you have a nominal interest rate, there are two components to it. There's an expected inflation and an expected real interest rate. So here's what I did. Every year, I got the inflation number. That's a red part of the column. I took the real GDP growth each year. And I added the two numbers. If inflation is 3%, real GDP growth is 2%, I added 3 plus 2. I'm going to call that my intrinsic risk-free rate. You might say, that's a stupid thing to do. Hang in there with me. I did that every year. So the red inflation, green GDP growth, I graph it every year. The black line is the actual T-bond rate. Does it look like the two move together? I mean, I could show you the statistics with the correlation, but the two move incredibly well together. And look at the last decade. You had low inflation. And you had low or anemic growth. What's low plus low? Low. There's your answer. Why were rates low for the last decade? It was primarily because inflation was low and real growth was anemic. Did the Fed have a role? Absolutely. At the margin, I estimated the Fed effect has to be about 0.25% over the entire decade. It kept rates about a quarter percent lower than they could have been by doing all kinds of gymnastics with you know, buying back bonds. It's a, it's a tougher sales pitch. I, I mean, I can show the people multiple graphs. They walk away saying, no, you must be wrong. The Fed sets rates. Because how do you counter hours that you hear? Every Wall Street Journal article, what will the Fed do? You know, what, what will it do to rates? So you can make your own judgment. Actually, last year, I have the table rate every day, and I have the Fed funds rate changing during the course of the year. You make a decision as to whether Fed funds rates drive table rates or whether table rates drive Fed funds rate. A sensible central bank will make it look like they're the ones setting rates, because that's where your power comes from. It's like the Wizard of Oz. Your, your power comes from the perception of your power. And God help you if people lose faith in that perception. Happened to the Japanese central bank about 30 years ago. 
for the last 30 years, you know what the Japanese central bank's effect on markets has been? Nothing. Once you lose that power, you've lost every piece of control you have. But I want you to factor in, if, you, if you're asking what will happen to rates this year, what are the two questions you need to answer then? Not what the Fed will do, but what will inflation do? If inflation stays at 5%, I don't care what gymnastics the Fed does, rates are going to stay high. And what will real growth look like? That's what's going to drive rates this year. It's those fundamentals. Now let's wrap up the risk-free rate discussion by talking about negative risk-free rates. Now currencies like the Japanese yen, the Euro, or, and Swiss franc, where the risk-free rates turn negative. As I said, that makes people uncomfortable. In fact, the rationale that people did for not value companies, if I use a negative risk-free rate, I'm going to end up with a really low discount rate. Yes, but complete the story. You're going to end up with a really low discount rate. But what are you discounting? Cash flows in the same economy, right? And if you have an economy with negative risk-free rates, what does the economy look like? For excuse me, Negative risk-free rates are not a sign of a you know, growing, healthy economy. There's something fundamentally flawed in the economy, right? Maybe negative growth going forward, deflation. And you should be building those into your cash flows as well. If you use negative risk-free rates, you will get low discount rates, but negative risk-free rates also go with negative growth rates in perpetuity. They go with really low growth rates during your growth period. I mean, I value dozens of European companies with negative risk-free rates. None of, I mean, I didn't get a bias up from the fact that risk-free rates were negative because I tried to make sure that whatever caused rates to be negative were also reflected in my expected cash flows. So I'm going to stop there because risk-free rates, I mean, I know I started this by saying, let's take the easiest of the inputs. And if this is what the easiest of the inputs look like, you're probably saying, I, I hate to see what the more difficult inputs look like. But I think this is the input on which there's the most misconception, right? Because people have all these preconceptions, central bank set rates, the, you know, rates don't change that much. And I want you to step back and kind of say, you know what? Many of these preconceptions are no longer true. We need to think about risk-free rates from the ground up. So I will see you on Monday. Uh, when we are valuing uh, a company at present moment, uh, why do we take risk free rate that is currently there? Because if I plan to sell it after five years, should I predict what the risk free rate will be after five years? Well, it isn't the value of company now, it's comparing to what you can get on a long term investment now. Five years from now, you want to sell it, you got to look at what risk free rates are then, right? That's a, that's a different decision. That's a selling decision you're going to make based on value then and price then. It's got nothing to do with the decision you're making today. Right? Gracias.